Welcome back, online family. Uh, today's topic of discussion is breakdown of Matthew 5, verses 25 and 26. Let us get into it. It goes on to say, when you are on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. Word of the Lord. So what does that mean? Breaking this down, uh, this is a... Uh, before I talk about this, I want to give someone a template here. Uh, I think templates are, or the building a template is important for teachings because I think in order for you to truthfully understand certain uh, things the Bible teaches, you need a template around, you know, the, the teaching to be able to have other pieces of scriptures you can pull from to to better understand the scripture at hand. So, okay, who is teaching? This is Jesus during the Beatitudes. So, okay, a lot of the times, I think some of us, we, we don't read the Bible with spiritual eyes because unfortunately in the American church, you know, I believe the pulpit has been hijacked by a lot of false pastors. So they teach the scriptures in a way that is, how would I say this? They teach the scriptures from a, a carnal perspective. In fact, a lot of times you have guys up there and it's really philosophy. They're teaching opinion and they're not, because some of these guys have died spiritually, because some of these guys don't even have the spirit, they teach the scriptures in such a way that you don't really see the mind of God. You don't see the scriptures through the lens of God because the scriptures can only be taught, you know, uh, through the lens of God, if the individual teaching from the scriptures has been submerged in the presence of God to be able to see, because God is the one who opens our eyes. He has to be the one that opens our eyes. So when someone truthfully saturates themselves in the presence of God, God will open their eyes to see certain things. And when they see things, now they can begin to share what God has showed them. And so my point is in the American church, because we the church has been hijacked by you know, a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing, the scriptures are not being taught properly. And so now because of that, the people who are sitting under these individuals, they read scripture, but they read it from a carnal perspective rather than from a spiritual lens. So now to continue, the Bible tells us in John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And it's speaking of Jesus. So now if Jesus is God, he comes from God, you know, so that makes him equal to God. So he's everything about him is like God. Like he said to Philip in John 14, if you see me, you have seen the father because he's in me, I'm in him. Okay, well, the Bible also says in John chapter four, verses 24, that God is spirit. So because God is spirit and Jesus and God are one, they're equal. And so he possesses the same nature as God. That means when he speaks, he's speaking from a spiritual point of view because God is spirit. So that means when Jesus is speaking, you always have to look at everything he's saying twofold because yes, Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. But when Jesus is speaking, he's going to always speak from a human example point of view, meaning everything he uses when he's teaching are human or earthly things that humans can relate to. But the meaning behind it is spiritual. So now when you're reading Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 and 26, again, he's speaking of earthly things. He says, when you're on your way to court, there's a court in the earth with your adversary, meaning when two people are going to court, one person is accusing the other. So he's using an earthly example, but he's really teaching something that is a spiritual law, a spiritual principle, which is what? One thing we have to understand is that when we are in habitual sin, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be habitual sin, because there are certain sins that, you know, they garner, you know, greater consequences than others. For example, if someone murders someone versus someone taking a red light, the con they both sin, they both violated the law, you know, in America, but the consequences for the guy who took a red light is a ticket maybe a hundred bucks and the consequence for the guy who killed someone you know and shot him you know for no reason is you know uh prison for life so what's my point there are habitual sins you may commit 
that may be minor in terms of they might the, the repercussions for them may be minor. Whereas there's others, there's greater sins that have greater consequences. So what does that mean? When he's saying when you are on your way to your court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly, that is speaking of repentance. Why is that? Because you have to understand that there are monitoring spirits. So Satan is not omnipresent. So because Satan's not everywhere, he uses what you call demons. So demons are in all different parts of the world, all different parts of homes, different parts of businesses. All you can think about it, demons are present. We can't necessarily see them because our eyes are closed to see them. God can open our eyes to see them. But the reality is demons are everywhere. So now the demon monitors you because he's the one who reports to Satan. So the demon monitors you and the demons as well as Satan know this Bible because you think about a police officer. A police officer has to know all the laws of the land, specifically in the state he's a police officer in. So that way, if you're violating a law, he will be able to know that he can pull you over. I can't pull you over if I didn't know. If, if I'm a police officer in the state that I live in, in America, if I don't know that taking a red light is against the law and people are taking a red light in front of me, I'm not going to pull them over because I didn't even know that was a like a violation of a law. So the police officers have to know all the laws. And now they're surveillancing and monitoring people as they drive by to see who's breaking these laws. And whoever's breaking these laws, they have legal rights to pull you over and give you a ticket. And so it's the same thing in the, in the realm of the spirit. So God says, forgive your brothers and sisters, right? Those who wronged you, forgive them. That's a spiritual law that has been instituted. So demons now, what they can do, this is a practical example. A demon can use a non-believer because again, when you're a non-believer, you don't believe in Jesus. And even if you believe in Jesus, but if you believe in Jesus and you don't read the word and apply the word, then you're really an empty vessel, which means demons can use you to persecute someone. So a demon can enter into a non-spirit-filled a non -spirit -filled believer or non-spirit-filled individual. And the demon uses that person to say, let's just say, punch you in the face for no reason. Now, you want to retaliate and fight this individual. And maybe you do do that. But after the fight's broken up, you go your way, this individual goes their way. But now you're left with a scar in your heart. Like, man, why do they do that? Screw that person. He is dead to me. So now what happens is you have anger in your heart towards that individual for what they did. But the word of God says you're supposed to forgive them because you've made so many mistakes in your life and God has forgiven you every time you've called out to him for, repent, for for forgiveness and he forgives you. So he says, because of that, you have to extend that same level of forgiveness. This person could have did that because they had a bad day. Maybe you s said the wrong thing at the wrong time. But the point of emphasis is when you are a child of God, you have, you're you held responsible to read the scriptures and know what God requires of you. Just like a police officer has to read the laws to know what he can and cannot do. Well, because God says you have to forgive, the demon wants to test you sometimes. So he'll use someone to do something to piss you off, to make you now not like that person and hate them in your heart. But the problem is if you don't forgive them from your heart, God, you're going to be in trouble with God now because you're violating a law that God put in play. And so what demons do now, they're looking at you to see, okay, because they can see in the spirit. You have to understand you and me and all creation, we're naked in the spiritual realm. And then in the spiritual realm, we're naked. Yeah, we got, I got a shirt on, I got a hat on. But listen, because demons, they are spirits, they see in the spirit. You and me are all naked in the spirit. So if you have unforgiveness in your heart, in the spirit, they can see that. If you have lust in you, in the spirit, they can see that. And so when they see that you are violating spiritual laws, which is everything you read in the scriptures, forgive, you know, uh, don't steal, don't murder, you know, don't cheat on your wife. Like these are all laws instituted by God. So when you're violating them in the spirit, those stains are on you and they can see those things. And so what they do now, because demons want to be able to possess people, Demons, you have to understand, they don't want to live outside of a body because spirits, when they're in the earth, they were meant to be in the body. Don't forget, God created the man, the first man, Adam. 
He formed man and then he breathed the breath of life, which is a spirit into the man, which means the first time we see the, the, the spirit outside of the spirit of God, which was hovering over the waters, come to fruition in the earth, it is in a person. And the Bible also says that the spirit of God is in Christ because it says he's the visible image of the invisible God. God in his fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ. So even the spirit of God dwells in Christ. That's why Jesus is God in the flesh because God dwelt, dwells in him. But my point is spirits, when they're in the earth, you know, unless an angel, which possesses a spirit as well, comes down from heaven to commission or give a message. When you're talking about humans, we, the spirit that God has breathed into us, it's designed to be in us. So now demons, because demons came to being because of the angels who sinned against God and slept with the daughters of men, according to the book of one Enoch, what happens is when the demons, I mean, when the spirit that was in these giants, which are the children of the fallen angels, when those giants died, because they would have been called half breeds, half angel, half human, when they died, the spirit that was in them didn't get to go to heaven. And that's the reason why demonic spirits were on the earth. That's where they come from. When the flood happened and the giants died, the spirit that was in those giants now roams the earth. You see that? So now, but those spirits that are called demons now, evil spirits that came to be, that came to be through sin, those spirits no longer have a body because the body they dwelt in being the giants is no longer here. So those spirits are roaming the earth looking for someone to devour. That's why 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 says, Stay alert, watch out for your adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion, doing what? Seeking someone to devour. How does he devour you? He needs to dwell in you. How did the how did the devil devour Judas? He entered into Judas and used Judas to sell Jesus and ultimately caused Judas to kill himself. But how did he devour Judas? He had to enter into him to do that. That's why Jesus speaks of the devil and he says he comes to, he comes to, he comes to do what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Who was he coming to steal from, kill, and destroy? People. How does he do it? He enters into you. That's why the devil and his demons want to enter into people. Because if they can enter into you, now they can control what you do. The same way when the Holy Spirit enters into an individual, now they can heal people. Now they can preach the gospel with boldness and conviction. Why? Because there's a spirit that has entered into them that enables them to be able to function in such gifting. And so in the same in retrospect, you see that when the evil spirit enters into an individual. Now that spirit has a home. Now that spirit can wreak havoc. Now that spirit can kill, steal, and destroy others as well as even possibly yourself. And so how does that spirit get access? It comes back to this very verse. You see how I'm going on a plethora, you know, of, of things, or I'm speaking of a plethora of different things originating from these two simple verses. You see how powerful these two simple verses are? There's so much meat. There's so much spiritual meat and potatoes that is, you know, uh, hidden in this verse that if you don't interpret it properly, you read this and don't really see anything here. And you think this verse, these two verses are not really saying anything, but they're saying a lot because it said again, it says, when you're on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. I said to you, what that talking about is repentance, because if you don't repent and you have unrepentant sin in you, what happens now, there's a demon who is pleading his case in the court and who the court is. That's the court of the Lord. That's this. There's a, you have to understand the same way there's courts in the earth, there's courts in the heavenly realm. People have to understand this. Everything on earth is a replica of what's in heaven, which means like when you talk about cars, you talk about houses, you talk about people, you talk about jobs in the heavenly realm, all that exists. And I think a lot of times we don't really think about it that way. We think that, like Jesus said in John 14, if there was a, if this wasn't true, would I have told you I was going to prepare, go prepare a place for you? What you have to understand now is the same way there's a court in the earth, there's a court in heaven. And I want to show this to you really fast as I continue to allow the Holy Spirit to speak. And I pray this is helping somebody. So in the book of Job, look what it says in the book of Job. You know, when it's speaking of the heavenly courts, just to show somebody that, yes, there are court courts in heaven and God is a just judge. So let's see what it says in Job 1 verses 6. It says, one day, look at this, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser Satan came with them. You see that? So when the members of the heavenly court 
assembled themselves, the sons of God, the angels, the accuser came with them. You see that? Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. And look what Satan answers. He says, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. That's why Peter writes, watch out for your adversary who prowls around looking for someone to devour. Satan said to God in the heavenly courts, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. And so his demons do the same thing. And so when it says when you are on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences, you have to understand why. Because the devil comes to accuse you. Let's run to Zechariah really fast to see this. So in the book of Zechariah, you're going to see this again in the heavenly place. You're going to see an accusation is being brought up against Yeshua, you know, uh, the high priest. And let's see what it says my god you know it's powerful because i said to you when you are in sin habitually again you're violating scripture i'm not forgiving nobody you know i'm stealing from the job yo i'm cheating on my wife man you know i'm living a lifestyle of lgbtq and i don't care i do what i want what happens is you don't understand because you are in rebellion to the word of god and the laws and decrees of God that in itself gives demons legal rights when they're accusing you before God that is going to give them legal rights because they're bringing a case and remember God the father of heaven the God the father yes God you know the Lord of Lords he is a just judge so because he's a just judge you got to understand if that demon has legal rights and his claim the same way someone says yo I have proof he murdered my brother that judge, he's going to look at all the facts. So look at all the evidence and say, you're guilty. You're guilty. The facts have been proven. You're guilty. It's the same thing in the heavenlies because God is a just judge. Yo, you cheating on your wife. The demon of herpes like, yo, I should be able to get him now. Like, he's cheating. All right, get him. You know? He's committing adultery. She's committing adultery. Aid says, yo, I should be able to get her. She's an adultery. She's having three dudes this week. And then, you know what happens? You know what? You're right. She's in violation of, she's sleeping with married men. Next thing you know, she has AIDS. But AIDS, that's a demon that's afflicting you. But how did that demon afflict you? There was a door that was open. This is why when it says when you're on your way to court with your adversary, set your differences. So let me show you something. As I was talking, I'm like running to get there in the book of Zechariah. I want to show you this in Zechariah chapter 4. Look what it says in Zechariah chapter 3, actually. It says, Then the angel showed me Yeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Look at this. The accuser Satan was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Yeshua. You see that? He's making accusations. But look what God says. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusation, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Yeshua's, clothing's, Yeshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the other standing there, take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Yeshua, he said, see, I have taken away your sins. And now I am giving you these fine new clothes. Then I said, they should also place a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean priestly turban on his head and dressed him in new clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly to Yeshua and said, This is what the Lord of heaven, heaven's armies says. If, gee, that's a key word. If you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple and its courtyard, courtyards. I will let you walk among those, these others standing here. Listen to me, O Yeshua, the high priest, and all you other priests. You are symbols of things to come. Soon I am going to bring my servant the branch. Now look at the jewel I have set before Yeshua, a single stone with seven facets. I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will remove the sins of this land in a single day. So what you see here is he's given us, he's solemnly warned, if you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over the temple. But what happens also that you see, which is the thing I really wanted you to see, was the accuser Satan was there, but his accusation, you know, was rejected. Meaning whatever he was accusing Yeshua of, which it doesn't really go into detail about. No, God, either Yeshua had already repented or the accusation was not accurate. But the point of emphasis is Yeshua 
was not handed to the officer being Satan because God rebuked Satan's accusations and rebuked the devil. So what you see there is what? When it's talking about when you're on your way to court with your adversary, study your differences quickly, it goes on to tell you why. It says, otherwise your accuser may hand you over to the judge. God is the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. Now, what does that mean? If you are rightfully accused by a demon, by the devil, he has legal rights. And now it says you're going to be handed over, you know, to an officer who will put you into prison. The officer is a demon. Okay. Satan has agents that work with him. Let me show you this to make this make sense for you. As you, someone might, st this might be going over somebody's head, but I pray even now as you watch this, may the Lord open your spiritual eyes, your spiritual ears to understand and to see, you know, and to hear. John 5, look what happens. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethsaida with five covered porches. Look at this. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Both he replied, But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. Look at this. Verse 14 is the anchor verse. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well. So stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Now, that the, the what he says that's going to prove it was a demon that was in him that afflicted him. How do we know that? Because pay attention to context clues. Jesus says, now stop sinning. He says, now you are well. He says, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. When he says something even worse may happen to him if he doesn't stop sinning, the reason why that's a direct correlation to a demon that had afflicting him, afflicted him is because when you go to the book of Matthew chapter 12, look what Jesus says, speaking of an evil spirit when it's in an individual. And let's see what it says in its, in, in, in its, uh, in its purest form. Verses 43, when an evil spirit leaves a person, look at this, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none. Then it says, look at this, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept and in order. Look at this. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and live there. And look at this. And so that person is worse off than before. This man had a demon because he was sinning. And we don't. And the demon actually made him lame. It afflicted his body, his legs. He became lame. Jesus hails him and says, stop sinning or something worse. Because when Jesus, when you're freed from a demon, that demon has realized a greater power has kicked me out. So the way the demon works now is when the demon's going to come back to see if you're open, seasoned, if you're not spirit filled yet, that demon's going to come with seven other wicked spirits because now that demon's trying to secure its place. It's kind of like you talk about NBA, right? This team lost in the playoffs this year. You know what they do next year? They want to buffer their roster even better. They, they go out and get other people. Pieces. Why? Well, last year we got bounced in the first round. We ain't trying to get bounced in the first round again. So we got to add other pieces. We got to add better players. It's like Dwayne Wade lost in the playoffs. I remember, you know, I believe it was in five games to the Boston Celtics. And then you know what happened the next year? He went out and the Heat went out and got Chris, uh, Chris Bosh. They went out and they got Shane Batty. They went out and they got LeBron James. You know what I'm saying? They went out and got Mike Miller. They went out and they basically got a lot of other guys that were way better than the previous players they had. And now guess what? They won two championships. Well, why? Because they added more firepower. Same thing. Golden State loses to the Cavs. You know what they went and did? They went and got KD. They went and got David West. They went and got Andre Iguodala. You see my point? My point is basically we lost. We got our butts kicked and we want to ensure that that doesn't happen again. So we're going to go get better talent. That's what demons do. We were kicked out of this man. Darn it. We're going to go back in that man 
But this time we come with more. He's like, I'm coming with more firepower and it'll be more difficult for you to get beyond. That's why Jesus is saying, you better not let that demon come back because Jesus understands if that demon comes back, he's not coming alone this time. It's like Draymond Green. Draymond Green lost the Brun and the Cavs, Kyrie and K-Love. He said, I'm coming back. But this time he came with KD. You know what I'm saying? He came with KD. Like Draymond came back the next year, but he's like, yo, I got KD now. Like, what are you going to do? You see my point? So it's kind of like that demon is just hoping and like, you know, salivating at the mouth that you give him a chance to come back. Because he's like, if I can just come back, I'm coming with firepower. And so Jesus tells this man, stop sinning or something even worse will happen, which is the same correlation to what he said in Matthew 12, speaking of a demon that leaves you and comes back and you're worse. So now that's the context of the officer he's talking about. And to also see this a step further, it's in Matthew 18, the parable that Jesus gives. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives a parable of a man, you know, and it's because Peter had asked him how, how often should I forgive seven times, but he said, no, 70 times seven. And he goes on to give a parable of a man who was forgiven of a tremendous debt by a king. And this is a parable speaking of God and the person is you or me. And this guy doesn't, he, he's forgiven a tremendous debt because like I said, you and me have made many mistakes in this life. We've sinned a bunch and God forgives us. So now this man had someone else who basically sinned against him because this person owed him. But the same grace and the same forgiveness that God extended to him, he didn't give it to the person that he that owed him. And so when that happens, look what it says. And I'm going to pick up this story in verses 31, Matthew 18, starting at verse 31. So it says, when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset because I said he didn't forgive the other guy. God just forgave you the tremendous debt. Now someone owes you and you don't want to forgive them. And he had that guy that owed him put in prison. So everyone else that knew that he was forgiven was kind of like, yo, that's messed up. So that's where we pick up the story in verses 31. It says, when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. You see that? Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers, your brothers and sisters from your heart. You see that? Like, this is a problem of God. He said, that's what God will do to you. So if he's given this story, which is a metaphorical story, it's a metaphor. Now bring it in real life format. What is that saying? If you're violating spiritual laws, those servants that were upset and went to the judge or went to the king, those are demons. Because I said to you, you have to understand that good and evil both serve God, whether you believe that or not. The Bible says God doesn't tempt people. You see that? If God doesn't tempt people, but tempting means testing. Temptation means te testing. Well, if God doesn't tempt us, who tempts us? The devil and his demons. Who gives them the right? I was actually just reading this. I believe in Lament Lamentations where we're saying that, you know, good uh all these things i'm gonna read it in its purest form lamentations i believe it was chapter three i was just doing this devotion this morning actually and lament lamp uh, lamentations um and i want to show you this because my point that i'm trying to get you to see is evil good and evil both serve god you have to understand that but evil serves what purposes for like when you and me want to violate the laws the same way police officers serve a purpose we don't like, a lot of people don't like police officers. You call them pigs. You call them lots of the names, which is, you know, uncalled for because, yes, yeah, some of them could be corrupt, but not all of them are. But the reality is they're needed in society because they lay down the law. They make sure the law, you know, uh, is, you know, uh, practiced and obeyed. And if you get outside of that, then there's consequences. And so what you have to understand is that's the same thing we see in scripture. And I'm going to read that really quickly if I can get there. In the book of Lamentations, it is chapter... That was in Lamentations. I was, I believe it was just chapter 5. Um, no, was it chapter 5? I believe. Um, Lamentations. I wonder if it's right there. Chapter, I believe it was actually chapter... Yeah, it was chapter three. Okay. And let me scan through real quick. Your turn. Oh, man. Wait a minute. Say that again. 
Okay, verses 32, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 32. It goes on to say, speaking of God, though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. Though he brings grief. You have to understand for grief, if he's bringing grief, that's a spirit. When someone is grieved, a spirit causes that. Something has to happen to grieve you. You lost a loved one. David lost his, when David sinned and he killed Uriah, took Bathsheba, and then took her as, a, he basically committed adultery, gets her pregnant. And now the son that he had with her, the first baby, what happened? The baby got struck it. So the baby's sick. David's grieved. He's praying, hoping that God will not, killed this baby but it doesn't happen so what causes grief a lot of times is these calamities that happen again you see your country is under siege you know by bandits you know your mom was robbed at the bank these things cause you grief and it goes on to say right there it says that uh though he brings grief he also shows compassion and i want to read it in another version because it's not worded the way I read it because I told you I read, you know, throughout I read different versions of the Bible because I just think because they've translated it sometimes, you know, reading it in it's in an older format. It words it in a way that kind of, you know, it hits home a little different, if that makes sense. And so I always say I read New King James, King James. I read um, New Living Translation. I read New American Standard and uh, but this morning I was in the King James. And so I want to get it in the King James version because I liked how it was worded there. And but right now that's like my NASB actually is what I have, but it's all right. So it was Lamentations chapter three. And we're looking at verses 30. We're looking at we were at verses 30. Which one was it? 32. So let's see what it says. OK, this one, the NASB says the same thing for he. Or if he causes grief, then he will have compassion. Okay. So, yes. Uh, and I I usually use my King James Bible from my phone. But because I'm recording right now, I can't grab it from there or the video will stop. But if you read that in the King James, it's probably worded a little different. But if you get the point is when you're talking about this officer, you know, who went in Matthew 18 in the parable, who went to the king and reported what had happened. What happened? Because God is a just judge. He's examining what happened the same way a judge is going to examine the claims of whatever they're accusing you of in the court and they're going to render justice to whoever is right. So when these servants, because I said to you, good and evil serve God. Remember that good and evil was something that you see that Adam and Eve didn't know about it. But if you pay attention closely in scripture, good and evil existed and it was something God knew about and he instituted good and evil for a reason. You know, evil was set in place. So that way, if you don't listen to me, I'll let evil touch you. That's the reason why Paul said, speaking of the man who was sleeping with his stepmother, let's see what Paul's advice was to the church of Corinth when he finds out that there's a man sleeping with his stepmother. This is why God created evil as well, because evil serves God. It Evil serves a purpose. So look what it says. It goes on to say, starting in 1 Corinthians 5, speaking of this story where Paul's finding out there's a man in the church who's sleeping with his stepmother. Look what he says. He says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in spirit, in the spirit. He says, and as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at this. You must call a meeting of the, of the church. I will be present with you in spirit. And so will the power of our Lord Jesus. 
Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the, on the day the Lord returns. So you see what he said? He said to hand this man over to Satan. Why was evil created? Because when you get in violation, this man is sleeping with his dad's wife. That's called adultery one. It's called, you know, fornication two. And it's just, it's a problem. It's a violate. Committing adultery was a, 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 a something that's forbidden. And so what is the consequence that Paul is teaching the church? Give them to Satan the same way. What happened in Matthew 18 in this parable? Give them to, to give them to the officer. Who's the officer? Remember 1 Peter 5, 8. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. What did the devil say to God in Job 1? I have been patrolling. When you're driving on the highway, what is that officer doing with the binoculars? He's patrolling. He's trying to see who's violating the law. Who's driving 80 miles an hour so I can get you. You see that? So what happens is when Paul heard of this, he said, throw him to Satan. Why? That's why. Because Satan's going to afflict you. That's why Jesus said to the man in John 5, stop sinning or something worse will happen. Because a demon was given legal rights to afflict him because he gave it legal grounds to do so. So Paul said, throw this man to Satan because if, you, if that happens, his sinful nature is going to be destroyed. Why? Because you see when the devil afflicts someone with cancer, you know, they're paralyzed in the leg. You see, there's something about grief. <laughs> there's something about pain. There's something about sorrow. There's something about calamity that makes us run back to God. See, when your, when your sinful nature is going to be destroyed because the devil is going to inflict, afflict you, that's usually what's going to lead you to repentance. Think about it. Paul himself, the Bible taught, he taught, he himself talks about that, that he, God allowed Satan to buffet him by afflicting him with a bodily condition. Why? Because pride was growing. And if pride gets to the place where pride is in you, God, the Bible says in James 4, 6, God resists the proud. So pride is about to grow up in Paul. God sees that he allows Satan to buffet him a little bit to keep that pride down. What's the point? That's why he says, you know, now I, I will boast about my infirmities. So you have to see that, you know, evil is created because in a, in a weird way, it keeps you and me in check. You're not going to listen. I'm going to let evil touch you. That's why when you look at Deuteronomy 28, you get the blessings if you obey, the curses if you don't. And look at the curses. I'm going to deliver you to your enemies. But don't forget, Ephesians 6 tells us our enemies are not actually flesh and blood. Our enemies are those, you know, the principalities, the spirit, the, par the spirits in the spiritual realm. That's the reason why even when God told Satan, okay, you can test Job, Satan didn't show up. People showed up and began to, you know, kill and destroy. Bandits showed up. Raiders showed up. What happened? Wind showed up. But what's causing that? Because the devil is behind all that, which means when God delivers you to your adversary, Things like that happen. You get in a car accident and your legs are cut off and amputated. You lose a child. You lose your job. You lose everything because now you've been delivered to this demon to wreak havoc. But what happens when that begins to happen, that's why when you now go back, as we're like I said, we're really getting some meat and potatoes on, again, these two simple verses that are not as simple as you thought they were. You know, in Matthew 5. Verses 25 and 26, he says, again, settle the difference before you get to the court. Why? Because he says, if you don't settle that difference, like I said, if you don't repent, that's why when you and me sin, we better repent and you better repent right now. I understand sometimes you sin and then the devil makes you feel guilty and he makes you feel dirty and you feel like I can't talk to God. God doesn't want to see me. And then you're stalling and you're you're not repentant. I've made that mistake, you know, made a masturbator to watch porn and you, you know, back in the day and you fall and then what happens is that like you feel ashamed, you feel dirty, and you don't want to go to God. You don't want to talk because that's what, what happened to Adam when he sinned. He, he's hiding. He doesn't want because something when, when we're when we're in sin, something about sin makes us guilty. It makes us feel dirty. And because God is so pure and holy, and we know that in our innermost being, we don't want to go next to Him. So what happens a lot of times when we sin? I would encourage somebody. I don't care what your sin was. You might have been at a. You might be a stripper. You might be an alcoholic, a drug dealer. I don't care what your sin is. But what I'm encouraging you is if you sin, immediately after your sin, repent. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't say, I'll do it next week. I just, I, the God doesn't want to talk to me or I just feel too dirty. Because if you put it off, the devil's happy. Because if you 
don't repent again. I'm not going to forgive. Maybe next year when I see him at Thanksgiving, I'll forgive him. No, no, because if you put it off, the devil's like, bet I have an accusation against him. That's why when he was in Zechariah chapter three, he was trying to accuse Yeshua. But because Yeshua is probably already repented and it's proof he's repented because of Satan's rebuke, that means he's repented. That's why it says there's no condemnation for those who are crazy Jesus. So you have to see that Yeshua was repentant. Because he's repentant, your accusation against him is void. He's innocent because he repented. I forgave him. That's why I'm trying to get you to understand. If you sin now, you are not forgiving this individual. You are treating, you know, your, your spouse indifferent. You know, whatever the sin is, don't put it off to repent. Because if you put it off to repent, there is a demon who is running to Satan to give him something against you. And Satan now is going to take that to court and say, God, he's unforgiveness. And then what happens? You lose peace. You lose joy. Doors close in your life. And so this is why this verse is powerful, because he's saying, if you don't settle your difference with your, with your adversary before you get there, he's going to hand you over to the judge. And that judge is God, as you saw in Matthew 18. And he says, if that happens... Meaning if you have not repented, if you like the man who's sleeping with a stepmom, he's not repenting. He's chilling. That's why Paul's saying, y'all should be ashamed because this is like a yeast and this little yeast can can affect all y'all. So Paul's like, like, this is a serious matter. This guy's not repenting. He's happy about it. Like, yo. And so what that means is if the officer gets to the judge, that is God, while you are not repentant. Now it says you will be thrown in prison. Not you might, you will be thrown in prison. Now, what is prison? The man who had his legs paralyzed, that's prison. You see that? David, whose body began to waste away, that's prison. David, who lost four children because of what he did, that's prison. My God. Paul, who now has this infirmity, that's prison. Remember in the book of Luke, chapter 13, the woman who was bent forward, what was it, for 18 years, and he said that Satan had done this. Look at this, Luke 13, Jesus heals a woman, because this is on the Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, and he saw a woman who had been crippled, look at this, by an evil spirit. So this woman's crippled, walking like front forward like this, because a spirit did that. An evil spirit did that. You see that? An evil spirit did that. She had, bet, she had been bent double for 18 years. So when he heals her of her sickness and she's able to stand straight and the synagogue leader is indignant, he's pissed off about it because it happened on the Sabbath, Jesus is going to reveal something. He goes on to say in verse 16, this dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? You see that? You see the verbiage he's using? Released. Her bondage was prison and he released her. Her debt was paid. And this is why I'm saying to you, this verse in Matthew 5, may the Lord allow this teaching to really sink deep into your heart, into your soul, and may you never forget it. It's a verse that changed my life because I started to realize that legal rights is a thing that happened in the spirit realm. And Jesus goes on to conclude in verses 26. He says, and if that happens, meaning if that accusation is brought up against you and it's an accurate accusation, he says, and if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. The same way, okay, in the court of law, you did, you know, shoot her in the leg, you're going to be in prison for five years. And until the five years is done, you're in prison. It's the same thing. So now the devil has something against you, legal rights, you're going to be paralyzed for the next 20 years. You're going to be bent forward for the next 18 years. You're, this dude was like paralyzed, I think it was for 38 years. You got to understand, this is why we got to read the scriptures. This is why you read the scriptures. Scriptures are not boring to me anymore. Growing up, because it wasn't introduced to me as um, my parents didn't do it, I think they didn't introduce to me like the importance of why I should read scripture. It was more like a thing you just do. But I think today, by the grace of God, I understand, no, I need to hold on dear to the scriptures because it's the difference between living and dying spiritually. It's the difference between, you know, reaping the benefits and the blessings of God and not. It's the difference between being spirit-filled and, or being possessed by demons who are wreaking havoc in your body because demon, demons come from the devil. They're linked to Satan. They're going to have the same nature, which is kill, steal, and destroy. So when a demon is in you, that demon's here to kill, steal, and destroy. You and those around you, those, everything you possess, your money, your house, your job. So, But you don't want to have demons in you. But demons, they are going to plant you know, traps around you 
hoping you violate these spiritual laws so they can have access to live in you. And that's what Matthew 20, Matthew 5 verses 25 and 26 is talking about. Um, I pray this video really helps somebody because like I said, you know, Hosea 4, 6, it says that my people are perishing. You know, God speaking, saying his people are perishing because of a lack of knowledge. And we don't understand these verses and we're not, again, interpreting them in the spiritual format that Jesus was speaking about. Then you miss the gem that is hidden in the verse. And when you miss the gem, you don't have the knowledge. When you don't have the knowledge, you perish because when you are faced in a situation, like, again, a test is given to you. You didn't study. You don't have the knowledge of what this like what the heck is this question talking about you lack the knowledge you can't pass the test you don't pass the test you don't pass the grade and it's the same thing when these spiritual tests are coming to you and you don't have the spiritual knowledge because you have not studied to show yourself approved you have not spent time in the word what happens you're going to fail that test this demon's going to accuse you he's going to have legal rights and you're going to be put in prison because god's a just judge listen if you shoot somebody without reason you're going to prison like that's just how that goes. They have they have you on camera, bro. You walked in the store, shot the owner in his arm, almost killed him, stole half the items in the store. They have you on footage. They have your car license plate. When they come to your house and arrest you, you're going to prison. They have legal rights to do that. And it's the same thing. You're violating spiritual laws. These demons are going to accuse you. And unfortunately, you will be handed to prison. That's why you better repent. The good news is you watch a video like this, it should be encouraging to you that this love in God and this grace in God, that's why Jesus is saying, settle your differences before you get there. That's repentance. That's called repentance. Settle the So that way, by the time the devil gets to the court of God to say, yo, Jr. was doing X, Y, and Z, what he doesn't know is Jr. already repented. And because I already repented, God has already forgiven me. God's forgiveness for you and me is instant, man. And that's why I tell you, don't put it off. Forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart, man. I understand what this individual could have did, but forgive them or you're going to be bondage, the demons. Listen to the voice of God. Read the word. Meditate on it day and night because it's the difference between living and dying. It's the difference between being in prison and being in bondage and being free. Ask somebody who's been in a physical prison for over five years or 10 years. How was that? It's devastating. Now, imagine that in a spiritual sense, someone who's been paralyzed for the last 10 years, someone who has to live with AIDS. It's not fun. May the Lord bless you.